And welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Leslie. And we have a very special proposal for you here today. Because I said I never do a reading vlog, we're going to do a reading vlog in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie here, of course, is very into horror books, but has never read a horror comic before. Oh, dear. I've got a great comic that can start out for you because also I know that you love supporting independent authors and image mm -hmm. comics is one where the authors kind of own their own creations and i think it's a great opportunity to kind of combine that idea of jumping into horror along with supporting independent authors so is now a good time to tell you that i, I am much better with reading horror than visual like i might could read the haunting of hill house but watching it on the show Right, and that first issue doesn't pull any punches either, right? Oh, fantastic. So jumping into the visual horror of things, I think this will give you a good idea because it has been a long time since I've read this, but I still remember it as, as just, I really enjoyed the characters. It was just fun. It was a little bit exciting, but you'll have to remember the way I read this originally was one issue, one month at a time. And you read this how many years ago? In tw 2014 through like 2016. So you were also much younger and probably had a little bit of a different view on maybe what you thought about serial killers. Yeah, and I didn't have a son at the time either, and now that I do. That is awesome, and I'm all about it. So what we're going to be doing is filming and, f and editing into one video here, just a reaction video as we read through this comic book series called Nailbiter by Joshua Williamson and Mike Henderson. Uh, so when I was a kid, like my dad told me so many things that turned out not to be true. And in regards to nail biting, what he would tell me so that I would stop biting my nails is that if you eat, if you bite your nails, it's going to give you appendicitis. <laughs> <laughs> so every time we've mentioned this title for this comic, I instantly think, oh gosh, somebody's going to be biting their nails and I'm just thinking they're going to have appendicitis. Yeah. So Leslie here doesn't know what it's about. I've read issues one through 20. Let's look at the first couple of, of covers together and you can take a guess at what it's going to be about. That's disturbing. <laughs> is he eating his hand? This is issue one cover. Of a series called Nail Bite. You know, normally in a <laughs> horror story, the bad guy is doing things to other people. This guy is maiming himself. All right, let's look at cover number two here. We have a gentleman on in set in flames coming out of a book that someone's reading. See, that's what happens when you bite your nails. If you swallow your nails, they go into your stomach and release guys that look like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's look at cover number three. Okay, now that that is more of a traditional horror picture, in my opinion. Kind of reminds me of uh, Halloween 2, when like they're in the hospital, and he just kind of grabs like the scalpel or whatever. <sighs> I love the Halloween movies. They're my favorite. So issue number four. Okay, so is that a cemetery or a mausoleum or a little house of, with rivers of blood coming out? Looks like we've got some detectives on the scene in this one. And it's been six years now. I think since I've read this series yeah. and, uh, and I can recall what happens in each one of these. There's this, this is good storytelling just from the covers alone, which is kind of interesting issue number five. Okay. Uh, that looks like an more interesting take a darker take on Alice falling down the, the rabbit hole. Mm, I like it. I like a little psychological horror in a sense too, right? Yeah. I'm definitely interested. Let's look at the next, but not last Issue number six cover. So are these nail biters? Are they cannibals? And this baby <laughs> is a born cannibal? He also kind of reminds me of the Garbage Pail Kid card. Oh, I remember those. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. All right, so here's what this is about. If you haven't read the series before, let me sell you on it a little bit, and then we'll warn you before we get into spoilers here. But basically, the Buckaroo Butchers small backwater town in Oregon creates 16 of the world's most brutal serial killers, all coming from this small town. And one of them, Nailbiter, is kind of recently released, and there's an FBI agent that's that's going and tracking him down, and the FBI agent just goes missing, just, just disappears off the face of the earth. So now we enter into this mystery and horror plot where we discover a town's secret 
perhaps this a serial killer's past and perhaps a closet full of demons for the good guys is what we kind of explore in this piece. Okay, I'm very intrigued. I'm I'm all about this. So guys, this is Leslie's first horror comic. Let's see how she enjoys this. We're now going to jump into our reactions and we're going to go 10 issues at a time. We are back with issues 1 through 10. Leslie, we have learned that there are 16 buckaroo butchers coming from Buckaroo, Oregon. Does the lore work for you? Is this exciting to learn that this town has all of these murderers coming from it from like a mystery perspective? That's a very high number for me to suspend my belief for. Oh, you poopy head. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did, for what it's worth, I did change my mind as I progressed through those first 10 issues. To me, the town is really interesting, too, because we all know those small towns. I think you know about the small town, mm -hmm. co small town culture where you have people that everybody that knows someone that has been involved mm -hmm. in that. Or, you know, hey, that's the great grandson of so and so. And we see that represented here. We have all the town members are connected to this. But it's kind of like this lore, this the recess ground mentality of everybody knows something, but, you know, it's not written down and no one's quite sure. It's kind of a mystery. Yeah, I come from a very small town and it's still small. It's it's never progressed at all. It is still like one gas station, no schools. You have to get bussed out. So I've, I definitely related to that small town aspect. So it opens up with this crazy action scene, busting in the door with this dude chewing on some fingernails, right? And you're like, what is going on? And the next time we meet him, right, he's released, he's acquitted, and we're going to his house, and he's got blood all over himself again, and he's making a stew, very Hannibal Lecter-esque, right, where you're kind of yep. like, is that a stew or is that Carol? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I am. Um, that opener really kind of had me thinking I'm not going to make it through this if that's what if that's what I'm going to be seeing throughout this comic I'm, I'm not going to make it really far but I liked Warren I liked him very much which I think that's kind of how I was meant to kind of you know like the whole Hannibal Lecter thing you like Hannibal he's funny his play mm -hmm. on words throughout was just fantastic and I just really appreciated that. He was very charismatic. And I just thought, okay, you're, you're supposed to like this guy. That's how serial killers are kind of, uh, successful is because they're very attractive, usually very charismatic to catch their victims, so to speak. Right. And then our main character, much like, you know, to these points about Hannibal Lecter, Sheriff Crane dated him at one point, we learn, right? They went to prom together. There's a past between these two. And that past is being used as a weapon by the town, too. Yeah. And that's just one of the many elements that have me intrigued about this comic. There, There's not just the one thing that has me interested. We've got their relationship. I want to know about Finch, because that really sucked me in. Like when I read something horror or thriller, I need action at the start to suck me in. And when we flip past that front page and we get to Finch holding a gun to his own head about to commit suicide, mm -hmm. man, I was in. I was in. I want to know what's his story. I want to know about Crane and Warren. I want to, I mean, there's so much I want to know. I want to know about all these serial killers. Like that that point of view of the hand reaching out, right? We had the hand that that attacked, uh, was it, it was Hank, right? The hand, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. at that store. We've had a lot of moments of this, this person kind of orchestrating things. And we even had that reference where that guy uh, talked about, um, you can go and tell your master. So this guy mm -hmm. with like the leather gloves, he has a master that's orchestrating events behind the scene yet that we know nothing about. It's incredibly interesting to me. Well, and just, it was done so well. The, the artist's use of the foreground and background for those action scenes and just makes you not trust your own judgment. I, I like, you know, the scene where they're with a coroner and mm. the lights are flashing on and off. And mm -hmm. I mean, I was suspecting everybody. Like I said, at first, 16 serial killers in one town. Man, I don't believe that. But as the story progressed, now I, I 
I didn't care about it as I was looking at every character as, is this going to be Buckaroo's next serial killer? Is this Mm going to be number 17? Is this going to be number 17? Man, I was, I mean, I just benched those first 10 issues. And I would say that the combination of these two, you know, Williamson and Henderson in terms of the author and writer, they have Mm -hmm. in this series Mm -hmm. mastered from a comic perspective, the page turn reveal, which if you didn't know what a page turn reveal, it's when you turn the page and you may or may not be expecting something. It's, it's, you have Mm -hmm. these quick panels or something that quickly leads up to something. And then when you turn the page, you get this this very striking image that could either set up or or subvert your expectations, such as you know when they're bringing the preg- pregnant woman into the hospital, and you have the you turn mm-hmm. the page and she's stabbing him through the mouth and tongue with with the syringe, or the turn page where you weren't expecting it when you think that she's safe, Sheriff uh, Sheriff Crane, yeah. she lays down in the yeah. bed and you have this symmetrical look oh, at, at him being under the bed. You are just floored and i just this this book really has mastered that i think oh yeah i mean i i'm so glad my bed sits on the floor and that there's no way to get (laughs) under it because that would have had me checking uh that that scene really got me because i love the i love the true crime aspect of this i mean I've been, I've always been obsessed with watching all of those documentaries and just learning why people tick, why, why a real person, like just someone normal just starts on this murderous rampage. And that really appealed to me in this comic because these people were normal until they weren't. Like, you know, you mentioned Warren and Crane dated, they went to prom, everything was fine. And then it was after their prom that he like, he was gone so one of the issues was interestingly enough about brian michael bendis do you know who that is i did not know who he was but the context clues and then i read the foreword that was in the special edition that i picked up clued me in as to this was a real live actual comic creator being injected as a character what's funny though is he's really well known for having these really back and forth snappy dialogues but the page mm-hmm. will be like kind of like a static image, like how they were on the swing set. And there's just bubble, 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 bubble text bubble, 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 bubble hitting yeah. you. And it's hysterical because Williamson's almost kind of just playing with that concept too, writing like Brian Michael mm-hmm. Bendis would have written that scene as well too. How mm-hmm. there's just this huge long string of back and forth text bubbles. That's how his comics are too. It's a fun little nod to comic nerds. Yeah, and he didn't kill him. He didn't kill him off. You can't kill Brian Michael Bendis. He's too important. But when he got away and then he got that note at a signing, like even even just that, I know it was probably more on the humor side than anything, but still... That I'll let you go. You didn't get away. I'll let you go. All right, let's play let's play two quick rounds. I'm gonna do a rapid fire question of ally or enemy. I want to hear your expectations as to how they're gonna end up. Okay. All right, FBI agent Abigail Barker, ally or enemy? Ally. Warren Nailbiter. Ally or enemy. Oh. Uh like Hannibal Lecter, I think he's an ally until he decides he's not. Ally or enemy, Reverend Fairgold. Enemy. I hate him. Ally or enemy, Officer Link? Ally. Okay. Now, my last question I have for you is we've talked a little bit about people being fatalistically drawn to be a butcher. And then for some Mm -hmm. reason, they leave Buckaroo. They don't do their murders or get their start in Buckaroo. They leave Buckaroo to become what the monsters that they've become, right? Do you think that this is coincidence? Do you think there's a greater force behind it, whether it be man-made or supernatural? What do you think (sighs) is behind these Buckaroo butchers? I, I I literally do not know. I think it's connected to the bees. Maybe there's. I, I, I honestly, I have no idea. I I have no idea. <laughs> but but you're intrigued, and and we saw we saw at the end of issue ten that strange mm-hmm. underground thing. It may be connected mm-hmm. to these tunnels. We'll see where it goes. We're gonna catch up with you guys here in the next installment with issues eleven through twenty. Okay, first of all, Leslie, I blame you. I am terrified of charismatic people from what you said in our last discussion because you're absolutely right. Why? 
serial killers really do have to manipulate you and be likable. They're not those creepy outsiders a lot of the time. I mean, you're related to them. You work with them. You live next door to them. But here's the thing. In this block of the comics that we read, I used to only be suspicious and looking sideways and squinted at the Buckaroo residents. Mm. In this block... What happened? Our world expanded. We found out that some of these residents snuck out of Buckaroo, changed their names, Mm -hmm. have transplanted outside of Buckaroo, and like that scared the stuffing out of me. Because at this point, everyone is a suspect. I'm looking at everybody sideways, and some of the reveals that we got just blew my mind. And I will say from a writing perspective, this is extremely well done. We lost Hank fairly early in this series, mm-hmm. right? And already yeah. we're, we're expressing this grief from the mom who's hallucinating, which plays in with, you know, Abigail Barker, who was abducted and had some type of like an experiment or something we assume or trauma done to her. And I think the illustration of Abigail's hallucinations were done so well. Mm-hmm. You just never knew what to expect. And you would just have this random pain where... She's imagining herself killing people. Mm -hmm. And then it turns Mm -hmm. out it was a hallucination. And so I got a little, what's the word to it? Numb to it, I guess. And I stopped expecting one to be real. And then suddenly... We've talked before about how literature allows us to see the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves. And Mm -hmm. sometimes when you just get so mad at someone, you can, Mm -hmm. not necessarily death, but you can can almost imagine harm to them. You can can wish bad things that happen to them and here abigail's having that happen with these these hallucinations and it sounds so weird but i can almost relate to that get that out of my head that's disgusting i don't want to think that like i want to be a good person how could a normal person who abigail is Mm -hmm. and she has trauma happen to her and all of a sudden she is now having these thoughts that are just like (laughs) <laughs> well, but see, on the other side of that coin, Meredith, the mother, she's doing the same thing a little differently. She's pretending her son is not dead. She is mm, going about mm. daily life, like telling the husband, hey, if you see Hank, tell him to make sure he's home for dinner tonight. And he's like, he's gone. He's with the angels. And she's like, I know. And then just proceeds to carry on like she didn't hear what he said. And I just, that felt so real. That just Man, that was just a a connection right there. And I didn't expect that with comics. I did not expect a a drawn picture was going to connect me with these people in this manner. And isn't that just how we are, like just true to human beings? I was talking about Mm -hmm. this with my wife. We've been watching some documentaries on serial killers, mass murderers and such. And something that I don't fully understand, you know, I'm not licensed in this, you know, I'm not a doctor. But what Mm -hmm. they're talking about is a lot of times, you know, the question of is there such a thing as pure evil, which was Ted Bundy's aura when when he kind of got caught. And they started digging further and further into his background, and they always find a traumatic event, whether the person's tortured, abused. Mm -hmm. Something has happened to them as as kids. So it's almost creating this, this, this world where we come into the world and they always say children are innocent and they have to have something happen to them to make them become evil. And I can't mm-hmm. help but feel is that maybe part of the conversation in this comic, right? Because mm-hmm. we have Edward Warren and all of these buckaroo butchers that have had something happen in these caves. They, we put on this facade of this cave that's existed for years, or even they're talking about like that, that um, Warren was talking about the Halloween kids. He's like, good thing those Halloween kids won't grow up to be the next butchers. Like, Yeah, how does he know that? Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that's just fascinating is we always want to know what was that traumatic event? Why did someone decide to become what we would call evil? Yeah, I I am just dying to know <laughs> what is going on in those caves that are turning these people. Because whatever it was happened to Abigail. All right, so talking about big reveals. We've had a lot of interesting stuff in this issue. Alice is Crane and Warren's child. I did not see that coming. I mean, first of all, you were totally right when you made the prediction that those two uh, had some some intimate time together. 
I kind of thought maybe they didn't, but they did, and then she ended up pregnant. Well, it's worth adding that I've read this section before. I had actually completely forgotten that Alice was their, their kid, so that was a re surprise for me. But I did know about the prom background. I could recall that. Gotcha. One thing that's interesting to me as we go through this middle section here is the illusion, right? We have mm-hmm. we have all those caves that you're thinking it's some ancient Mesopotamic, you know, our Aztec ruins, only to find out that it's only 40, 50, 60 years old. We have mm-hmm. the cult, right? This idea that we're putting on these these church garbs and we're creating this lynch mob. Well, that was all kind of a facade too. And uh, it speaks to real trauma that people have experienced and things that could happen in real life. But we keep peeling back the layers to realize that these are just people. These are just angry people who don't want these things to happen or someone creating this fake environment like these caves to do some type of really horrible thing. I don't know what's going to happen at the end. I really don't. But I feel like it has to play into this motif of something appearing supernatural or crazy only to find out that it's completely normal at there or that there was a design behind it. Well, when they had the reveal that the Aztec temple was fake, I sort of thought back to the very beginning when we started and we met, well, you say Rayleigh, but I call him Raleigh, and the murder store and how hokey it was. I I had to wonder if there was a connection between those two. That's a good point. I kind of forgot about that because he did call that guy, I think, master or or something along Mm -hmm. those lines. But he's obviously involved somehow, maybe to that point of putting on a show, putting on a a mythos of Mm -hmm. what the butchers Mm -hmm. are, while they're orchestrating yep. something like behind the scenes, you know what I mean? Like, like not that it fits this narrative, but you could see maybe if the narrative was different, it could be like someone's running for mayor or someone wanted to own the town and they're trying to drive away, you know, it's the Scooby-Doo thing, right? What's the yeah. purpose of why we're pulling these strings? I feel like we have to get to what's that Scooby-Doo design behind this? What did you think about Abigail bringing Finch back in? I thought it was necessary. We can't we can't just let Finch go. This is going to be a group effort between Crane, Warren, and Finch to solve this. Well, and you mentioned Warren. What did you think about his character development in this section? How do you feel about him now? Oh, I loved I loved I it. I feel a little different. I feel a little different. I um and then it could but it could totally be a red herring. Like it it may be that he's showing being shown in a helpful light while also not being able to fight against his nature, whatever has made him the nail biter, the serial killer. He can't fight it, but he, for himself personally, but he is trying to fight it for the others to protect the others of Buckaroo. I really liked it, but I'm scared because I just feel like it's a red herring and it's going to, it's going to turn around and, uh, well, fight me. He, he had that fight with that that butcher that he lost, mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. have to assume what happened to Barker is what happened to Warren, right? He's been yep. programmed to do something, and I think it's going to be that cliche line of him fighting against his programming for saving his friends is what we're ultimately going mm-hmm. to get to. Uh, and I think obviously he's going to save his friends. I think that that's how this is being structured. No, nope. It's going to be Alice. It's going to come down to Alice. He's, he's going to find out that she's his daughter. She's going to be a victim of whoever this is in the cave. And that's, what's going to allow him to break his conditioning. I think, I think you're, you're wise beyond your years, Leslie. I think that's a great (laughs) predicting. All right. Let's delay no further. Let's tackle the last section of Nailbiter and find out what the chilling conclusion to this is going to be. Let me ask you a question. So with the ending and with Warren discovering he doesn't have this gene, do you feel that maybe the Nailbiter comic was just one big prologue for Warren's self-discovery, a journey of discovering what makes him self-tick? Because it sounded to me through this journey of these 30 issues that he was trying to find a cause, meaning there might be a cure. And then he discovers he doesn't have this gene. It's strictly him actively choosing to murder these people. And with that sequel coming, I wonder if it's just going to be focused 
solely on him and just murderous rampage. Well, here's, I've had a limited interaction with, with Joshua Williamson and I asked him one question and that question was, this was uh, when he was, this was as it was being released. I asked him, mm -hmm. do you have an end planned? Like, is there a definite end issue for Nailbiter? Because we didn't know how long it was going to be at this time. We didn't know it was going to be 30 mm -hmm. issues, 40 issues, 50 issues. And uh, what he said was, he said, yes, I have a very specific ending in mind. Now, whether that's what he delivered in Nailbiter or what he plans to expand in realizing that he wanted to explore more in Nailbiter Returns, I don't know. But that's my one interaction I had with him. Interesting. Now, here's the question. Now, I, I don't read a ton of horror. That's more of your specialty. Mm -hmm. I read more comics, but I don't specialize in horror comics specifically. As a, as a reader of horror, typically in, in book format, how did this translate for you? Did it, was it a similar experience having the visual side of things? Did it increase the experience for you? It definitely increased the experience. And that is strictly a compliment to the artist because he just really... While the art was simplistic, what he did, the magic of just his use of adding little things in the background or having lights flicker on and off, just the certain scenes that were so profound. Like there was one scene where the butcher is standing over Alice. She's blindfolded. She has no idea he's there. The rain is coming down on him. I could hear the rain. I mean, I just felt like I was standing there. The, the artwork was just amazing. It went really well. I thought I was going to have a problem seeing it visually, but it, it really just added to the experience in just a phenomenal way for me. So I'm, I'm hooked. I'm hooked on the horror comics for sure. I got to be honest. I'm sitting there in bed. I'm in issue 27. <laughs> and my wife says something. It's just like a real brief something. I literally was like, <gasps> like I gasped because I was, I was totally forgetting that I was reading something. Like I'm, I'm picturing myself in the moment. I was so engrossed in the reading. It was really interesting. But with that said, okay, so if we're going to come to like, okay, what's, what's a criticism of it? Like these last few sections, okay, before we get to the main point of what the book was, the characters kept making these choices where I'm like, why would he do that? Like, like in the car when they're doing buddy cop. I'm like, yes, buddy cop yeah. with Finch picking up Worm. And then he bites him and gets away. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And then and then there's the Christmas, right? Like it's at Christmas time, a time of redemption. And then all of a sudden he's shot. And I'm like, well, that's a weird choice to make that kind of happen. And then even with Barker, you know, being absolutely crazy and then just kind of making a choice of just, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. Like the the theme of choice, which was the purpose of this ending, I think. Let's get into what that ending means. But it threw me. It was not what I was expecting. But I know that there is a second issue. There's a second run. There's there's a sequel, Nail Bite of the Return. So mm -hmm. they might have had that in mind when they brought this to a close. But the whole, are you born a killer question throughout this, I thought, I, I think those those choices they were making, especially with Warren, led up to that ending where, you know, they're doing this experiment. They have this thing that can tell if there's a gene in someone where they can become a serial killer. And then mm -hmm. they set about enacting that gene, bringing it forward and bringing that out in someone. And then Warren took the test and it was negative. And I, I believe that the reason why he was making those crazy choices that were so unlike some of the other character choices, I think that was kind of tying into he wasn't born that way. And I think that kind of broke him. I think that scared the stuffing out of him because right. he has no excuse for being this killer. Yeah, I, I think stylistically, structurally, there's nothing wrong. It, it was just an expectation that I have. In, in my reality, you don't make a choice. Like these murderers, they don't really, I mean, they make choices true. I don't want to absolve them of yeah. that, that they're not involved in that. But there's, there's, be behind that choice that's what we didn't explore right right that what made them this way not the choice was this and yes there is a choice mm -hmm. yes ish right like like the mental side of things when it comes to real life is, is going to be a little bit more questionable and you know we're not counselors or, or specialists in that but we never attempted to get deeper than that uh, so i i hope I, I look forward to nail biter returns we need to do that once it's once, once it's coming out here fully out and uh, really kind of see how do they explore this further, because that's what I wanted to get into. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's what I'm hungry for. Right. 
And uh, I believe we are discussing some other image comics that we could potentially jump into. So, guys, if you had fun on this journey, you know, I know this comic has been out for a while. You know, you need to let us know down below if this is a need that you have, because sometimes we read these comics and we don't have people to talk about. And we're hoping to fulfill that and give you guys an opportunity and a chance to kind of join in on the conversation and let us know what you guys thought of this down below. So with that said, guys, you know, I'm Una. Appreciate you guys coming in to check out our chat here. We're going to post videos Monday and Thursday every week. Una out. See you guys.